This extraordinary active plant has changed the shape of its leaves once again. Once we had a number one hit, then that gave them the inspiration and the urge to do more and to write better. They weren't deep songs. I had not known you a month before I felt you were the last man in the world whom I could ever marry. Leave my spell alone. Go away. Oh, my goodness. You were in the Space Scouts? Oh, yes. Pinkle, squirmy, blip, blap, blap. <laughs> This enormous chick weighs 10 kilos, as much as a full-grown swan. Can I ask for a Christmas present? Yeah, sure. What was? Uh, I'd like a uh, one-way air ticket from the South Pole to London, please. Echo had found a small waterhole, but the stranded calf was clearly suffering in the heat. They lurk in the darkest of corners, or control entire landscapes. This plant, the... Giant arum of Borneo develops the biggest undivided leaf of all. The Emperor Alexius has decided he needs some help from his brother Christians in the West. So he's sending a letter to the Pope asking for help. People have often said that Motown kind of made us over and made us into these sophisticated little dolls, you know. But I think that's something that we, we brought within ourselves. In 1914, a whole generation is drawn into the world's first mass war. On one of the last nights of the First World War, a company of soldiers took refuge from enemy bombardment. Their officer wrote to his mother in a spirit of hope. My dearest mother, so thick is the smoke in this cellar that I can hardly see by a candle 12 inches away. And so thick are the inmates that I can hardly write for pokes, nudges and jolts. On my left, the company commander snores on a bench. It is a great life. I am more oblivious than alas, yourself, dear mother, of the ghastly glimmering of the guns outside and the hollow crashing of the shells. I hope you are as warm as I am, as serene in your room as I am here. I am certain you could not be visited by a band of friends half so fine as surround me here. There is no danger down here, or if any, it will be well over before you read these lines. A fortnight later, the guns of the Great War fell silent. It was the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918. One hour later, there was a knock on the door of the officer's home. As neighbours celebrated the end of the war, the officer's mother was handed a telegram. In the war's final week, while taking part in an assault on the German lines, her son had been killed. The dead soldier, 25-year-old Lieutenant Wilfred Owen. Yet Owen was just one of the lost generation. 
Nine million people killed during four years of world war. In which people, land and nations were changed forever. The years 1914 to 18 set the violent 20th century in motion. The first use of chemical weapons. The first mass bombardment of civilians from the sky. The century's first genocide. Never in history had so many taken up arms. Never had war reached so far beyond the battlefield. Never had war cut so deeply into society. Eighty years on, diaries, letters and film from expanding archives around the world tell the story of the men and women from five continents for whom this war was the defining moment of their lives. It would be called the Great War, for it coloured everything that came before and shadowed everything that followed. Every search for the origins of the Great War comes back to Germany. Its state, militaristic and volatile. Its people, modern, industrious, and determined to better their position in the world. Its generals, obsessed with shows of greatness, but insecure about Germany's status as an imperial power. All these tensions were symbolized in one man. The Kaiser, Wilhelm II, the figurehead of German imperial ambition. He was destined to be the living emblem of national pride. A difficult role for a crippled man. An accident at birth had made him partly deaf, affected his balance, and left him with a withered arm. What medicine could not improve, Wilhelm's parents had hoped discipline would. Their son's tutor, Dr. Georg Hinspeter, was to make no allowances for his pupil's arm. He was to force the boy to ride in the posture of a true German warrior. When the prince was eight years old, a lackey still had to lead his pony by the rein because his balance was so bad that his unsteadiness caused intolerable anxiety to himself and others. It had to be overcome, no matter what the cost. Therefore, I set the weeping prince on his horse without stirrups and compelled him to go through the various paces. He fell off continually. Every time, despite his prayers and tears, I lifted him up and set him upon its back again. After weeks of torture, the difficult task was accomplished. He got his balance. England was where the young Prince Wilhelm found an escape from such humiliations. As a grandson of Queen Victoria, he frequently visited her seaside estate at Osborne, on the Isle of Wight. In a specially built playground, with trenches and a miniature fort, 
he and his British cousins would fight out their version of an ancient rivalry. It was here that he began a lifelong obsession with the sea. I had a peculiar passion for the Navy. It sprang to no small extent from my English blood. When, as a little boy, I was allowed to visit Portsmouth and Plymouth, I admired the proud English ships. There awoke in me the wish to build ships of my own like these someday, and when I was grown up, to possess as fine a navy as the English. When Wilhelm became Emperor of Germany in 1888 at the age of 29, the insecurities of his youth were played out on the stage of German affairs. To his commanders, he explained his role. All of you know nothing. I alone know something. I alone decide. You've got to imagine a, a man who has all kinds of terrible complexes. He wants, in a sense, to be a as, as, as big a figure on the world stage as his uh, British cousins. Um, he wants to be as uh, striking and impressive a political figure. And to some extent, the Kaiser, I think, is cut off from reality. Wilhelm's dreams of naval glory were exploited by German admirals who longed to match the sea power of Britain. By 1905, a huge fleet of warships was in the making. With such symbols of imperial power and progress, Wilhelm struck a chord with his people. The Kaiser was universally seen as being the symbol of the new Germany. Uh, and he did embody it to an, an amazing extent. Uh, he embodied its old-fashioned militarism. He embodied its uh, undirected ambition uh, towards a dominance in the future of a kind which nobody could, could quite define. He embodied the insecurity, the uncertainties, the neurosis uh, which so dominated German society and which was seen by everybody as making Germany such an unpredictable and dangerous partner uh, in the manipulation of the international system. To other nations in Europe, Germany's intentions seem menacing and uncertain. Yet the Kaiser had inherited a nation that had grown accustomed to peace. Chancellor Otto von Bismarck's astute diplomacy had kept Germany out of wars since 1871. Bismarck had no foreign ambitions. He'd used treaties and alliances to keep on civil terms with the other great powers, Great Britain, France, Austria-Hungary, but above all, to avoid war with Russia. But Wilhelm had no respect for Bismarck's delicate balance of power. The Kaiser felt that he represented the new Germany, Quite where Germany was going to go, he didn't know, but at full speed ahead. Wilhelm sent Bismarck into retirement and abandoned the treaties. Military expansion replaced diplomacy. His announcement that Germany would build a new navy had turned a potential ally, Great Britain, into a potential enemy. And now, in 1912, a massive expansion of his army, making it the most powerful in Europe, challenged Russia and France. Germany had only one reliable ally, the fragile empire of Austria-Hungary, ruled by the aging emperor, Franz Josef. Germany felt increasingly surrounded and as insecure as its ruler. International war was only one of the paths the century promised. Other developments pointed to an entirely different future. 
a revolution in technology was sweeping the Western world. Electricity turned night into day. Motor cars changed the speed of travel. Aircraft defied gravity. To the monarchs, rulers and elites of Europe, the technological explosion heralded a new era they did not understand. Yet the lives of ordinary people were being altered profoundly. A fundamental change was taking place in their expectations, their work, their world. It is in many respects the, the moment when a vision of immense and unlimited possibilities became available to anybody. And of course, what that meant is not necessarily hope. It could also mean intense frustration, because with the vision that possibilities are there comes the question, why not me? Why not farmers? Why not factory uh, employees? Why not women? These two elements of imbalance of power, of inequality between those who have and those who have not, between those who are running the show and those who feel that they ought to be running the show, produce this amazing sense of an approaching storm in 1914. What storm it will be, nobody knew, but it was going to come. The dynamics of change were racing ahead of the political order that supposedly controlled them. In Britain, bitter conflicts raged over social injustice, and high in the headlines were the clashes over women's right to vote. There was a view that women shouldn't have the vote for all sorts of reasons, one of them being that a woman's brain was smaller than a man's brain, therefore she couldn't possibly make this political choice when it came to an election. That it just was not within her kind of intellectual capacity to make that kind of a choice. It sounds ludicrous to us, but this was something that even the most intelligent people believed very firmly. The suffragettes spearheaded the drive to win British women the vote. When peaceful protest did not succeed, they turned to violence with a campaign of arson and bombing. They chose as targets those symbols of male authority, church and property. On Derby Day in 1913, the campaign claimed its first life. A lone suffragette Emily Wilding Davison walked onto the racetrack to block the King's horse. The British government began a campaign to silence the suffragettes. Men who committed acts of civil disobedience were given special status as political prisoners, but the suffragettes were treated as common criminals. Seven months before the outbreak of war, the leading suffragette, Sylvia Pankhurst, was sent to prison for breaking a window. I was torn with a passion of self-contempt that I had endured the torturing indignity for so long. My voice, high-pitched and strange, cried out that it was a scandal that four of us should be serving five months in all for one little three-pound window. That the government had had their pound of flesh, and far, far more. That this torture had been going on year after year, woman after woman had been broken and destroyed, and all because a handful of men stood against us like a solid wall in their sullen, cruel obstinacy, and would not give way. Some for the sake of their jobs. Some for the sake of their pride. Seven. 
As those without a say raised their voices, a new age took shape, an age of protest and defiance. The new banner of socialism was one revolutionary cause with a growing following. Socialism tried to address basic concerns, wages, exploitation, terrible living conditions. Its leader in France was Jean Jaurès, a socialist who dominated the revolutionary movement. A third of France voted socialist in 1914 and nearly a million had joined trade unions. A visiting journalist from Vienna was struck by Jaurès' unusual figure. I first noticed his large back built like a street porter's, his neck like a bull's, short, stocky. And I felt immediately in him the strength of the peasant, unshakable. Jaurès saw Europe's arms race as a threat to social justice. He believed that whilst socialists should defend their homelands, growing arsenals served only the ruling classes and their hold on military power. What will the future be like when the billions, now thrown away in preparation for war, are spent on useful things to increase the well-being of people, on the construction of decent houses for workers, on improving transportation, on reclaiming the land. The fever of imperialism has become a sickness. It is the disease of a badly run society which does not know how to use its energies at home. He knew how to take action, real action. First of all, he had parliament. Second, Jaurès was trying to set up international arbitration in case there were a war. Third, and that was Jaurès's strongest card, call an international workers' strike, a general strike in all the countries that might go to war. In 1912, Jean Jaurès organized an emergency socialist congress in Switzerland. War appeared to be near. Local feuds in the Balkans between Slavs and Austrians threatened to escalate into a full-scale conflict. 500 delegates from 23 nations filled the hall of Baal's great cathedral. Jaurès climbed the pulpit, determined to inspire the delegates to return to their homes with a message of peace. I think of the words which Schiller inscribed at the head of his beautiful Song of the Bell. I summon the living, I mourn the dead, I break the thunderbolts. Then Jaurès leaned forward and appealed to the sea of upturned faces. I summon the living to resist the monster which would ravage the land. I mourn the countless dead now buried in the east, whose rotting stench fills us with remorse. I will break the thunderbolts of war now hurtling across the sky. Then Jaurès paused, and in a final theatrical coup, the strains of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony filled the cathedral. Let us leave this hall committed to the salvation of peace and civilization. The Baal Congress asserted that workers would not fight in a meaningless Balkan quarrel. In Berlin, a quarter of a million people marched against war.
As governments backed away from war, Jaurès became convinced that Europe was on the brink of a new age of peace. But within two years, he would be proven wrong. The forces of change were undermining societies that had endured for centuries. In Russia, Tsar Nicholas II's Romanov dynasty symbolized a world that appeared impervious to threat. But now Russia too was on the brink of a new age. Communications, I think, opened people's eyes no end to what the possibilities are and to what is wrong with present circumstances. And then it was perfectly true to say that large numbers of peasants living in the far flung bits of Russia would think very warmly of, uh, of little Father Tsar who will protect us from the nobility and from his own bureaucrats. But as telegraphs grow and as newspapers grow and as the peasants begin to read uh, and as the socialist revolutionaries get around the villages, these ideas get very much weaker. Peasants could now travel to the capital and see their Tsar at first hand. The writer Maxim Gorky recorded one peasant's experience upon meeting Nicholas in 1902. This is what happened to me when I met the Tsar. Imagine to yourself that you believed in some inaccessible person, thought that in that person were united all the finest qualities, all the strength, the wisdom and holiness of Russia. All of a sudden, at the bidding of fate, you are placed eye to eye with that person. And you see. With sorrow and fear, you see. But he is not what you supposed. The glitter around him and the splendor are all there. But it is all a sham. Thus I saw in front of me. Not the Tsar of my imagination, not the sovereign of my dreams. Not even a big man, just a little fellow and on very ordinary legs. From the east of Europe to the west, a social revolution was underway. In Germany, workers were experiencing the fastest changes of all. In just 30 years, Berlin had been transformed from a backwater of 700,000 to a mechanized metropolis of over 2 million. Many middle-class Germans shared their Kaiser's belief in the supremacy of German Kultur. For them, it was necessary to secure Germany the continental domination it deserved. And in that sense, the Kaiser is in some ways representative of that generation which comes of age in the 1890s. Bismarck regarded colonies as a distraction. Well, for younger people, this was all a little bit fuddy-duddy, and if the Kaiser was going to give them colonies, uh, they liked the sound of that. German workers were the most militant and best organized anywhere. Workers' power here was more than a vague ideal. It had found real expression in the million-strong socialist party that now appeared ready to challenge the state. The old order dreamed of imperial glory. Their challengers demanded equality. This created an extraordinarily explosive mixture where the most powerful nation in the world, Germany, had the most powerful revolutionary movement in the world, the German Social Democratic Party. And it's a function of the pace of change and the pace of urbanization that you both had this amazing militarization and growth of military power and proletarianization, growth of working class power. And they were both evident together. 
the Kaiser would have demonstrations for his birthday, the Social Democratic Party would have demonstrations for the 1st of May, and they were about the same size. It was not at all surprising that anybody who lived in Germany would find this the most dynamic, the most robust, and the most terrifying nation in the world. The wealthy Germans who controlled the country saw socialism as a sinister force. Socialism threatened their prosperity and might prevent Germany from becoming a world power. Socialists argued for progress through peace. The ruling elite disagreed. One of the trendy ideas of the pre-1914 world is um, social Darwinism. You, you take the ideas of Darwin about natural selection and you apply them to human society and you come to the conclusion that the only way that human society can advance and progress is by being subjected periodically to the ultimate test of war. And war weeds out the weeds and replaces, uh, or rather uh, leaves behind only the, the fittest. One man who sensed the increasing tensions in pre-war Germany was a 28-year-old painter, Ludwig Meitner. Amid fears of war and revolution, Meitner lived and worked in a Berlin attic, painting at night by gaslight. From his brush came disturbing visions of an approaching apocalypse. It was a time unlike any other in the brooding metropolis of Berlin. I was poor, but not unhappy. I had made a home for myself in a cheap studio with an iron bedstead and a number of boxes that served as tables. Food was a minor matter, but canvas seemed the most valuable thing there was. I was in love with it, and I was not ashamed to kiss it with trembling lips before painting those ominous landscapes. I did not paint from life, but what my imagination bid me to paint. felt like a hound racing along in a wild chase mile after mile to find his master. A finished oil painting filled with apocalyptic ruin. I feared those visions. Other artists, musicians and writers across Europe shared Meitner's sense that a great cataclysm was at hand. There's a fever and there's a feeling everything had to come to an end. I mean, Duchamp said, you know, we need the great enema in Europe. And if, it, if it's going to be war, then if we need war, we need war. But we need a great enema. But they're actually seeing it in social terms. Meitner, he was like everybody else, he was reading Zarathustra at that point. And there is a famous text in Zarathustra where Nietzsche produces the idea that the cities literally, they are the melting pot of the modern humanity and they literally have to almost explode for this revolution to happen. Meitner had painted Germany's future. His country was about to explode, not into social revolution, but into war. In 1914, tensions were again running high in the troubled region of the Balkans. Tensions that would cast the fate of the world. The Austrian Empire was a patchwork of nationalities. Among them were Serbs. Some wanted to break away and join the independent and growing kingdom of Serbia. Gavrilo Princip was one of them. 
a member of the secret Serbian society, the Black Hand, he aimed to force Austria from Slav lands. On June the 28th, 1914, the heir to the Austrian throne, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, paid an official visit to the city of Sarajevo with his wife. At 11 o'clock, a wrong turn by the Archduke's driver brought him face to face with Gavrilo Princip. The murder of the heir to the Austrian throne was the ultimate insult to Austria's ruler, Emperor Franz Josef. Austria issued an ultimatum designed to humiliate Serbia. One of its demands, acceptance of an Austrian inquiry into Serbia's responsibility for the assassination. The rejection of this one demand was the excuse Austria had been looking for to invade. The Austrians issued their ultimatum to the Serbs uh, on the assumption that the Serbs would reject it and the Austrians would then be able to declare war on them and crush them. However, they realized that if they did that, there was a strong danger that Russia would come in on the side of the Serbs. So therefore, before issuing their ultimatum at all, the Austrians cleared their rear, as it were, by going to Berlin and getting from Berlin what was called a blank check. So, yes, go ahead and we will back you uh, as far as you want to go. Now, the Germans issued that blank check because they felt they could not afford to see their only ally in Europe uh, humiliated and destroyed. By giving Austria her blank check, Germany had brought into play the established alliance system. One pair of great powers, Austria-Hungary and Germany, were allied against another pair of great powers, Russia and France. War between Austria and Serbia would mean war between Austria and Russia, that would mean war between Russia and Germany. And that would mean war between Germany and France. The stage was set. As the prospect of international war grew closer, the French leader Jean Jaurès found he was unable to unite socialists behind peace. He climbed aboard a train for Paris and exhausted fell asleep. Sitting in the compartment across from Jaurès were two friends. They both found themselves staring into his face as he slept. All those fortunate enough to know Jaurès personally had always been inspired by his good humour and inexhaustible vitality. But now it seemed to us he was deeply sad, full of grief, brought on by his clear vision of the horrible catastrophe about to overtake mankind. As we looked at his wonderful face, we were each suddenly overcome with a feeling that he was dead. I froze with fright. How often I had thought to myself, what would we do if we lost him? Events were moving too fast for Jaurès, for diplomats and even heads of state. On the deadline, the day Austria had set for war, the Tsar cabled his cousin, the Kaiser. July the 28th, to the Kaiser. In this most serious moment, I appeal to you to help me. I beg you in the name of our old friendship to do what you can to stop your allies from going too far. Nikki. to the Tsar. With regard to the hearty and tender friendship which binds both of us from long ago with firm ties, I am exerting my utmost influence to arrive at a satisfactory understanding with you.
your very sincere and devoted friend and cousin, Willie. The Kaiser basically wants to avoid the general war. It then becomes clear that the Kaiser, far from being the supreme power in Germany, doesn't matter at all because um, effectively the chief of the general staff says, I'm terribly sorry, sire, uh, but the war is going to happen anyway. On July the 29th, 1914, Austria attacked Serbia. As Germany had anticipated, Russian military commanders demanded action when Serbia, their ally, came under attack. The next day, the Tsar's staff told him there was no longer an option. Russia must mobilize. Think what an awful responsibility you're advising me to take. Think of the thousands and thousands of men who will be sent to their deaths. Nicholas held out until four o'clock in the afternoon. Then he signed the order. The hidden element in the war crisis of 1914 is the word honor. Honor is something you defend, sometimes irrationally, sometimes even when it isn't an issue. In fact, I would say in every case, it was in no great power's interest to go to war in 1914, and yet they all did it. And one answer may be because their honor was at stake. Russian mobilization was just what the German general staff wanted. Now Germany could mobilize under the pretense that it was only responding to a threat. On the evening of July the 31st, as France planned its response to the crisis, Jean Jaurès and his colleagues gathered at a café on the Rue Montmartre. The group sat at a table near the window, listening to Jaurès' thoughts on the coming war. I gave my full attention to him while he gave his vision for mankind and of things to be. The expression on his face held enough for a Rembrandt. As Jaurès sat talking, a man stood on the pavement staring at him. He was Raoul Villain, a patriot who was thrilled by the prospect of a war, a war that he thought Jaurès would try to stop. As Villain watched, a man from a nearby table showed Jaurès a photograph of his little girl. At that moment, Villa leaned in through the window. Behind me, a revolver slid by, held in a hand. Then a reddish flash, like the flame from a cigar, stiff, brutal. I did not see any blood, just a painful shudder. was a silence. Then I heard a heartbreaking cry. Next came four words, yelled, screeched, repeated over and over. They have killed Jarez! They have killed Jarez! The assassination of Jarez coincides with the French mobilization the next day. And with general mobilization, how can you call a workers' strike? The idea was a strike not of soldiers, but of workers. And now all the workers have become soldiers, so how can you call them out on strike? The international general strike was what gave Jaurès his hope. The one man who called for that option in France was Jaurès. Whether he could have achieved it in July 1914, the fact is he didn't manage it. He didn't do it. The death of Jaurès draws a line. Everyone thought of it as, Jaurès is dead, so it's war. That's what they all said. 
On August the 4th, the Germans made their move against France, invading through Belgium. The Great War was born with the mobilization of Britain. There had been in England for the last 10 years a growing sense that sooner or later we've got to have a showdown with the Germans. And so there was no great surprise when this crisis arose. But in addition to that, the really clinching argument which brought the country into, into the war totally united was Germany's invasion of Belgium, which was not simply the invasion of a neutral country. It was a country whose neutrality the British themselves had guaranteed. So it was a matter not just of international morality and international law, but of Britain's honour being at stake. And all those things put together created virtual unanimity in the country behind Britain backing France. Germany had accepted the risk of a major war and her rivals had responded in kind. Better now than later was the view of the general staff. War it was to be. As news of the war hit the capitals of Europe, thousands of people surged into the streets. Counter-demonstrations evaporated, lacking popular support. It seemed to the artist Ludwig Meitner that his fellow Berliners had suddenly become possessed. And out of the depths of the earth rose dreadful fiends that settled in everyone's brains. And in their madness, they turned their scourge into a joyous festival. In each of the warring nations, citizens were convinced that their country was fighting a just and defensive war. Internal conflicts that had threatened to divide society were set aside. The great socialist movement found that the world of 1914 put patriotism first. The suffragettes decided they would support their fighting men and fight for their own rights later. Disaster lay ahead for the great monarchies on the continent. All their houses would fall. Tsars, Kaisers, Emperors. With less fanfare, millions of ordinary lives would also be changed forever.
soldiers across Europe left for war, the correspondent Philip Gibbs reported home to London. In those first days of the war, I saw many scenes of farewell. Hundreds of women were in the crowd, waving handkerchiefs. The sting of parting was forgotten in the enthusiasm and pride which rose up to those who were on their way to fight and to uphold their old traditions. I could see no tears then, but my own. I was seized with an emotion that made me shudder. For beyond the pageantry of the cavalcade, I saw the fields of war. I smelt the stench of blood, for I had been in the muck and misery of war before had seen the convoys of wounded crawling down the rutty roads. With men who had been strong and fine, now made hideous by pain. In Germany, as the army mobilized, a young student named Walter Limmer was one of those eager to serve his country. August the 3rd, 1914. At last, I have got my orders. Dear mother, please try to keep constantly before your mind what I have realized. If at this time we think of ourselves and those who belong to us, we shall be petty and weak. We must have a broad outlook and think of our nation, our fatherland, of God. All over Europe, soldiers were mobilizing for war, saying goodbye to their families and rushing to the front. Our march to the station was a gripping and uplifting experience. It seemed as if one lived through as much in that hour as ordinarily in months and years. This hour is one such as seldom strikes in the life of a nation. Germany's strategy, the Schlieffen Plan, required precision timing. In the east, the Russian army would be held at bay. In the west, the German army would avoid France's line of forts by sweeping west through neutral Belgium and then turning in a huge arc south into France. The French army would be trapped between Paris and its own frontier. The war on the western front would be over in six weeks. Then the German army would turn to Russia. The Kaiser summed up the plan in one phrase. Paris for lunch, dinner in St. Petersburg. My dear ones, be proud that you live in such a time and in such a nation and that you too have the privilege of sending several of those you love into this glorious struggle. It is a joy to go to the front with such comrades. We are bound to be victorious. On the morning of August the 4th, 1914, the German cavalry crossed the border into Belgium. Waiting for them was the small and poorly equipped Belgian force.
What the Belgians faced was the world's mightiest army, one over ten times the size of their own. Belgium's main hope lay in the ring of forts that protected the gateway city of Liège. But the German army had planned for the forts. They unveiled a secret weapon, the world's largest howitzer, Big Bertha. Concrete and steel forts, once thought impregnable, were blown apart by Big Bertha's one-ton shells. A Belgian commander described the aftermath. The fort is now in ruins. We are in complete darkness and scarcely able to breathe on account of the poisonous and noxious gases. A truce bearer demanded the surrender of the fort. We prefer dying to surrendering. The German army flooded across the Belgian plains. They expected no more resistance, but to their surprise, Belgian snipers started shooting. Warfare in Belgium soon became a hideous experience because civilians took part in the fight. The German soldier, Fritz Nagel, saw the fear of those around him turn into acts of reprisal against innocent victims. Unless they shot first, nobody knew where the enemy was. Whenever they had the chance, they shot down German soldiers. There was little defense against that sort of warfare because the streets were full of civilians and so were the houses. It was nerve-wracking in the extreme and resulted in savage and merciless slaughter at the slightest provocation. As we marched towards Louvain, frightened civilians lined the streets, hands held high as a sign of surrender. Those frightened men, women and children were a terrible sight. By now, every German soldier was frightened too. You get the orders from above to be as harsh as possible in order to stifle this from the very first moment. And that triggers off then this wave of rather violent actions and atrocities against the civilian population. Ten civilians, the Belgians were told, would die for every German soldier killed. Hundreds of men, women and children were lined up and shot. Word of the atrocities spread quickly. As the number of stories grew, each new version became more appalling. Wild claims were taken as fact. Soon images of a monstrous German Hun began appearing and found their way into newspapers. British war correspondents in Belgium have seen little murdered children with roasted feet. 
This was done by German troops, men with children of their own at home, or with little brothers and sisters of the same age as the innocents they torture before killing. The things done to Belgian girls and women are so unspeakably dreadful that details cannot be printed. Many of the stories that rapidly became uh, well known through the press formed the basis of a very substantial, probably the first substantial propaganda campaign in history. And it gave the Allies an extraordinary weapon because what it suggested was that the Germans committed atrocities not because they were soldiers, not because they were occupiers of Belgium, but because they were Germans. There was something genetic about their viciousness. And this was made into the imagery of the Hun. The Belgians had held up the German army for only a few days. But the real cost to Germany was the image of the violation of a small nation fighting for survival. The symbol of poor little Belgium would haunt the Germans for years to come. Of all the major powers in Europe, Britain alone relied upon a volunteer army. The Secretary of State for War, Lord Kitchener, believed Britain's small regular army would not be sufficient. The war, he predicted, would take at least three years. The British Army would require millions of recruits. From town walls to church pulpits, men were urged to take up arms for their country. The Yorkshire Post reported how even a football match turned into a recruiting drive. Stirring scenes were witnessed on the Leeds City Football Club's ground last evening at the end of the match. The Lord Mayor addressed a crowd of about 4,000 spectators. There was a spirited rush across the field and rousing cheers. Up the steps, sturdy young fellows came to receive an armlet of ribbon with the national colours and to win, perchance with their comrades, an imperishable glory on the battlefield. When the rush subsided, it was found that the number of volunteers was 149. The Lady Mayoress called for a further 51. Another dash was made, another round of prolonged cheering. And to the chorus of it's a long way to Tipperary, the quota was quickly filled. From the football field, the recruits marched to the town hall to enlist. Volunteers are to have good health, good teeth, and be aged between 19 and 30. Join up with your pals, soon became the recruiting slogan. The pals movement in Britain took off like a rocket. It became a matter of civic pride and community pride to raise local battalions of pals who would fight together, enlist together, serve together, train together, etc. And so, after uh, the end of September 1914, Kitchener had his expanded army. Well, that's it. I've joined now. I can't do any more. 
Well, she said, you can either have me or the pals. I said, well, it's got to be the pals. They asked me my height and I told them. They hummed and hard about it. I'm five foot six and worried stiff, so I filled my shoes with papers. Anyway, I says, well, there's my pals joining, six of us all joining, all footballers. So they says, oh, go on, let them go in. So I was one of the midgets. The thunderbolt fell with its signal of war, and in a few days, Paris was changed as though by some wizard's spell. A hush fell upon Montmartre, and the musicians in its orchestras packed up their instruments and scurried with scared faces to Berlin, Vienna, and Budapest. The Seine was very quiet beneath its bridges. The women were hiding in their rooms, asking God how they were going to live now that their lovers had gone away to fight. Journalist Philip Gibbs was in France when war broke out. Forbidden to travel with the army, he reported from Paris. There was no wild outbreak of jingo fever. No demonstrations of bloodlust against Germany in Paris or any town of France. The call to arms came without any loud clamor of bugles or orations. The quietness of Paris was astounding. This was not the first time France had gone to war against Germany. In 1871, a victorious Germany had claimed two of her richest provinces, Alsace and Lorraine, as spoils of war. Now a new generation was being called upon to defend France's honor. The continuous stream flows out towards death. Soldiers pass, singing and shouting to Berlin. Others go by in silence, fierce looking and determined. On this scene of desolation, the sun shone gloriously, indifferent to the troubles of this earth. Madame Camille Drumont of the French aristocracy was one of those mothers who watched her son go off to war. Now that the quiet of evening is falling, I'm thinking more than ever of you, my darling child. Where are you? What are you doing? This morning, I went into the drawing room 
and my eyes fell on your violin. I burst into tears and ran from the room. Like many in France, Madame Drumont was not ready for another war. The French commander disagreed. Joseph Jacques César Joffre was a champion of the offensive. Speed and bravery were of the essence. Heavy artillery, an impediment. The bayonet, he told his soldiers, was the supreme weapon for victory. The infantry bearing their bayonets, their rifles with bayonets, are really intended to terrify the enemy by the sight of cold steel. It is believed that an attacking force will look so ferocious and will behave so ferociously that an enemy will quail before the sheer valour and the bravery of this oncoming force. In the dawn and pallid sunlight of the morning, they came across the bridges with glinting rifles and the blue coats and red trousers of the infantry made them look in the distance like tin soldiers from a children's play box. I closed my eyes to shut out the glare and glitter of this kaleidoscope. What does it all mean? the surging tide of armed men. What would it mean in a day or two when another tide of men had swept up against it? Joffre was determined to strike out against Germany and win back France's lost provinces. Underestimating the strength of the German invasion of Belgium, the French followed their plan to move east towards Alsace and Lorraine. One of these French soldiers was Paul Lantier, who was about to enter battle for the first time. sensation grip my throat. The hour had come for me to sacrifice my life. My bleeding body would lie stretched out on the field. I seemed to see it. It was the end. It had not been long in coming, for I am only 21. Against heavy artillery and machine guns, Lantier's courage counted for little. His regiment lined up in a 19th century formation and advanced in full view. Shells continued to fly over us. The enemy was advancing. Entire companies of infantry fell back. We had lost the battle. The 19th century tradition of the army was of the self-sacrifice for, for the nation. And the beginning of the, of the 20th century was still in this mentality. Uh, these bright colors, especially the red uh, of the trousers, uh, of, of the caps too, uh, was a sign of, uh, of this uh, heroic ethic. Uh, of the war. It was absolutely, uh, it was a sign of cowardice to, to fight uh, uh, the enemy in, in green colors which, which couldn't be seen by the enemy itself. You had to, 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 to fight uh, openly. In four days, over 40,000 French soldiers were killed, 27,000 of them on a single day. August the 22nd, 1914, the bloodiest day in French military history. 
Soon, the French army was in retreat. A deep sense of shame oppressed us as we filed through these villages, which we were powerless to protect. We were abandoning them to the fury of the enemy. As the French army fell back, Joffre notified his government. In 12 days, the Germans would be at the walls of Paris. Would the city be ready, he asked, to withstand a siege? Everyone who could fled from the advancing Germans. Railways and roads were flooded with refugees. Madame Drummond watched them stream past her window. One can imagine nothing more dismal than the stream of fugitives along the roads of France. We saw them passing by our houses, coming from goodness knows where, piled up on carts with their animals, their bedding, and all their household goods. They had come through Paris, their horses almost dropping with exhaustion, to seek a refuge in some friendly place. But where that would be, they knew not. For the moment, their only idea was to go a long way away to the far ends of the earth. the German army approached Paris, Camille Drummond chose to flee too. She escaped by train for the French coast. Trains full of soldiers and even of wounded were caught up like us on parallel lines. All this confusion brought home to one the panic, the terror of the herd of human beings who, in order to escape from the enemy, were rushing headlong into the unknown. Another train had also drawn up, and in the moonlight, the two trains looked like long funeral processions. I was crying my face in my hands. All of a sudden, the most exquisite song rose in the tragic night. The voice came from the other train. It was a man's voice, and he sang the serenade from La Damnation de Faust. This song lifted my spirits from gloom and my soul from despair. In the moonlight, in the midst of all this human misery and distress, it was sublime. As refugees fled from war, the regular British expeditionary force began crossing the English Channel. Among them was a 20-year-old Irishman, John Lucy. Long before the war, he and his brother had joined the army to escape the boredom of life on an Irish farm. We were tired of fathers, of advice from relations, of bottled coffee essence, of school and of newspaper offices. The cattle, fowl, eggs, butter, bacon and the talk of politics filled us with loathing. Blow the lot. 
As a matter of fact, we were full of life and the spirit of adventure and wanted to spread our wings. We got adventure. We enlisted. At first, we could not follow the trend of events on the continent. Whom were we to fight? French, Russians, Germans? What did it matter? The doors of that rapid fire of ours, followed by an Irish being a charge, would soon fix things. On August the 22nd, John Lucy's unit reached the Belgian town of Mons. The very next day, they faced a German force that outnumbered them nearly three to one. The Germans attacked them in waves, advancing shoulder to shoulder over open fields. Our rapid fire was appalling, even to us, and the worst marksmen could not miss. And after the first shock of seeing men slowly and helplessly falling down as they were hit, gave us a great sense of power and pleasure. But within a few hours, John Lucy was astonished to hear that the British army was being ordered to retreat. The soldiers at Mons thought they'd done rather well in terms of um, holding off the oncoming masses for some time. I think the, the fact that they still then had to pull back um, added to this sort of sense of A, frustration and B, exhaustion. But simply, the, the weight of the German advance was too strong for such a small force, uh, particularly as it, it had only just got to the front line, basically. Every cell in our bodies craved rest. Men slept while they marched, and they dreamed as they walked. They talked of their homes, of their wives and mothers, of their simple ambitions, of beer and cosy pubs, and they talked of fantasies. The brains of soldiers became clouded when their feet moved automatically. Like the retreating British, the advancing German army was close to exhaustion. Then, as the German armies advanced deeper into France, gaps opened between them. To close up, they moved not to the west as planned, but to the east of the capital. The Germans were just 25 miles from Paris. This at last gave the French the chance to strike at the exposed German flank. To fail this time would be to lose Paris and the entire war. Paul Lantier was surprised to see even taxicabs heading for battle. Inside the cabs, I caught a glimpse of soldiers sleeping, their heads thrown back. Wounded? asked somebody. No, came the answer from a passing car. It's the 7th Division from Paris. They're off to the front. What followed was the Battle of the Marne. It lasted six days and involved two million men. When it was over, the German advance had been stopped. Paris had been saved. The Schlieffen plan was in ruins. A different kind of war began. Facing modern weapons, soldiers abandoned their 19th century tactics of open warfare and began digging into the earth. Trenches spread for mile after mile. Stalemate. And this is the first time that the British are up against the realities of trench warfare. And they're absolutely baffled as to why they have not been able to drive the Germans back, have not been able to break through. This is for them a whole new phenomenon. Four hundred thousand French soldiers had been killed 
simply to reach stalemate. German casualties were just as appalling. The small British force had been all but wiped out. John Lucy had survived, but not his brother. I dreamed of him at night. And once he appeared to visit me, laying a hand on each of my shoulders, telling me he was all right. I felt relieved after this curious dream. I was too weary to appreciate my own luck. My eyes weakened, wandered, and rested on the half-hidden corpses of men and youths. Proudly and sorrowfully, I looked at them. The Max and the Oars and the hardy Ulster boys joined together in death on a foreign field. My dead chums. While the German armies were pushing into France, German citizens were fleeing from their homes. They were escaping from a new threat. The Russian army had mobilized more quickly than expected. They were invading Germany in support of France. Now Germany faced a two-front war. The Russian army outnumbered the Germans four to one, but its troops were not the enormous threat they appeared to be. The Russian army is very much twixt and between. It's, uh, it, it, it's been expanding incredibly rapidly. And that meant an awful strain on the infrastructure with far too few officers and especially far too few NCOs for what still, to a large extent, is untrained peasantry. Bravery was not enough to overcome these problems. Artillery shells were rationed. Some soldiers went into battle without even a rifle. The Russian commanders, Pavel Renenkampf and Alexander Samsonov, were not on speaking terms. To bypass a 50-mile chain of lakes, the Russian generals split their army in two. It was a mistake. The Germans moved their forces south where they outnumbered and surrounded Samsonov's army at the Battle of Tannenberg. The defeat of the Russian army during the East Prussian campaign, which in the West is called the Battle of Tannenberg, was first and foremost caused by the incompetence of the Russian commanders who led the campaign. They made serious mistakes, which were exploited by the German commanders Hindenburg and Ludendorff. The German machine guns were deadly, mowing down rows of Russians immediately as they raised themselves in the potato fields to fire or to advance. Colonel Alfred Knox was a British officer assigned to observe the Russian advance. Instead, he witnessed the annihilation of Samsonov's army. Samsonov said repeatedly that the disgrace of such a defeat was more than he could bear. The Emperor trusted me. How can I face him after such a disaster? He 
went aside and his staff heard a shot. They searched for his body without success. But all are convinced that he shot himself. The Battle of Tannenberg was Germany's greatest victory of the war. 100,000 Russians were taken prisoner. 30,000 were killed. As the weapons of war became more deadly, soldiers tried out other ways of defending themselves. Chain mail visors to protect eyes from flying shrapnel. Bulletproof body armor. Mobile encasements for advancing across no man's land. These ideas provided little protection. The best soldiers could do was to continue digging into the earth. The first thing was it smelled bad. It smelled bad because there were open latrines everywhere. They weren't always used by the troops. There were bodies rotting everywhere. Both the Germans and the British were troubled with rats. The rats ate corpses, then they came in and snuggled next to you while you were sleeping. Sky study becomes one of your few amusements. You never see your enemy, the only thing you can see is the sky up above, actually. the little wet home in a trench, where the rainstorms continually drench. There's a dead cow close by with her feet in towards the sky, and she gives off a terrible stench. Underneath, in the place of a floor, there's a mass of wet mud and some straw. But with shells dropping there, there's no place to compare with my little wet home in the trench. Simply to stay alive, soldiers on both sides found ways to limit the killing. Command made it clear that a certain number of shells had to go over every day in order to uh, make life miserable for the enemy. But OK, you sent them over at that time of day when the enemy would not be having dinner. You wouldn't fire it at a position where you were likely to hurt many of the enemy. You actually hadn't done the enemy a lot of damage, but then he hadn't done you a lot of damage, and therefore you would live to fight another day. On Christmas Eve 1914, temperatures on the Western Front dropped below freezing. In some places, it began snowing, obscuring the moonlight. Then, right across the German lines, lights began to appear. The British braced themselves for an attack. But instead of rifle fire, the sound of singing drifted across no man's land. The Germans would be heard singing, Stille Nacht, Heilige Nacht. And the British would respond with a, a British Christmas carol. In some places, uh, food was lobbed over into the opposing trenches. One or two instances, the Germans erected Christmas trees. And 
there was a kind of mutual curiosity, um, certainly instances of soldiers applauding each other's singing. In one or two places on Christmas Day itself, the first curious, slightly headstrong people, perhaps from both sides, poked their head above the trenches and being made aware that somebody over the, the other side wasn't going to shoot it off, then clambered cautiously out. Captain Charles Stockwell was one of the first to take part. I ran out into the trench and found that the Saxons were shouting, don't shoot. We don't want to fight today. We will send you some beer. A German officer appeared and walked out into the middle of no man's land. So I moved out to meet him amidst the cheers of both sides. We met and formally saluted. He introduced himself as Count something or other and seemed a very decent fellow. The Christmas truce was the last twitch of the 19th century. By that I mean it was the last public moment in which it was assumed that people were nice. It was the last gesture that human beings are getting better the longer the human race goes on. December the 26th. At 8.30, I fired three shots in the air and put up a flag with Merry Christmas on it. The Germans put up a sheet with thank you on it. And the German captain appeared on the parapet. We both bowed and saluted. He fired two shots in the air. And the war was on again. In 1915, German airman Peter Strasser was in command of the Zeppelins that flew over Britain and carried out the first systematic bombing of civilians from the sky. We who strike the enemy where his heart beats have been slandered as baby killers and murderers of women. What we do is repugnant to us too, but necessary, very necessary. A soldier cannot function without the factory worker, the farmers and all the other providers behind them. Nowadays, 
There is no such animal as a non-combatant. Peter Strasser would not live to see the end of the war. His Zeppelin would be shot down. But in 1915, he knew that the nature of battle had changed forever. War in the 20th century would be a new kind of war. Early on April the 25th, 1915, an amphibious force of British, French, Australian and New Zealand troops began landing on the Turkish peninsula of Gallipoli. Their aim? To knock Germany's ally, Turkey, out of the war. Opposing them, on cliffs overlooking the shore, was a smaller Turkish force. From his battleship, the Allied commander, Sir Ian Hamilton, watched the spectacle unfold. The day was just breaking over the jagged hills. The landing of the lads from the south was in full swing. We could see boatloads making for the land, swarms trying to straighten themselves out along the shore. God, one would think, cannot see them at all, or he would put a stop to this sort of panorama altogether. The peninsula chosen for the assault guarded the entrance to the Dardanelles Straits. Four weeks earlier, the British Navy had failed to open up this route to the Black Sea and its ally, Russia. Now it was the army's turn. An amphibious expedition is the most difficult operation of warfare, especially if you're sending it against something like the Gallipoli Peninsula, which must be one of the most defensible pieces of geography in the world. What you've got is a very few beaches and then high cliffs, overhanging cliffs, towering hills, an absolutely ideal place for a defending force to place itself. By mid-afternoon on the first day, 8,000 Allied soldiers were on the beaches. The outnumbered Turks began to retreat, but Lieutenant Colonel Mustafa Kemal, the man who would become Ataturk, faced them. I said to the men who were running away, you cannot run away from the enemy. We have no ammunition, they said. If you haven't got ammunition, you have your bayonets. And shouting to the men, I made them fix their bayonets and lie down on the ground. I said, I don't order you to attack. I order you to die. The Turkish troops stood their ground allowing time for reinforcements to arrive. They knew they would die in about three minutes, but they showed not the least dismay. There was no wavering. Those who could read prepared to enter paradise with the Quran in their hands. Those who could not recited the martyr's prayer as they went forward. By holding the high ground, the Turks had trapped the Allies between the cliffs and the sea. From his ship, Hamilton could do nothing but order his men to hold the narrow beaches they occupied. You have got through the difficult business. Now you have only to dig, dig, dig. 
until you are safe. It's not really an episode in a great European war between industrial powers at all. It's the old British imperial tradition. And once it started not working, people decided, but good heavens, British prestige is at stake. That the whole Muslim world will feel that we have been humiliated. Gallipoli which was to have been a quick victory, was turning into an eastern version of the Western Front, a war of trenches and stalemate. As we approach the shore, what an aspect opens up before us. Valleys and valleys, scrub-covered hillsides. Men getting about everywhere and looking all the world like ants. But above all, the thing that meets, or rather hits the eye, is the number of dugouts. The whole landscape is covered with them. It looks for all the world like a mining camp. Cyril Lawrence was one of the Anzacs. Australian and New Zealand soldiers who went ashore at Gallipoli one month into the campaign. The trenches are totally different to what I expected. It is sure death to put your head up to look around. Even the periscope mirrors, measuring three inches square at most, are picked off one after the other. When the Turks charge, they usually cry, Allah, Allah. And our boys reply, come on, you bastards, we'll give you Allah. And from the frequent use of this word, poor old Turk wants to know if bastard is one of our gods. At some places, the trenches were very close. They could hear the voice of each other. They could hear the Turks singing songs in the evening. They asked questions at each other. Why are you fighting? Why are you here? It's very interesting. I mean, can you imagine a war during the eight and a half uh, months? They were fighting. Thousands of soldiers were killed on both sides. And still, they were not hating each other. The Turks were not simply fighting for their homeland. The Turkish soldier Hassan Etem, a teacher and law student before the war, described how they were also fighting for their faith. My dearest mother, I can see a line of soldiers washing their clothes in the stream near the emerald green hillside. One soldier with a beautiful voice is saying prayers. Everyone, everything is listening to that heavenly voice. I forgot all about the chaos and the war and the worldly troubles. I opened my hands, looked up at the heavens and said, God of Turks, master of the birds, the sheep, the leaves, the mountains. You have given all this to the Turks. Please leave it to the Turks. God, all this soldier wants is to keep this land from the British and the French. Grant me this wish. Please make the bayonets of the soldiers sharp and destroy our enemies. By summer, the Allied troops had still not moved. Hamilton realized that to take the high ground, he needed more men. His badly planned campaign and poorly equipped army had nowhere to go.
The War Office urged me to throw my brave troops yet once more against the machine guns in redoubts. To do it on the cheap. To do it without asking for the shells that give the attack a sporting chance. People slur over my appeal for the shells and yet continue to urge us on as if we were hanging back. The Allied troops clung to their strip of sand throughout autumn and into winter. In November, Lord Kitchener, the British Secretary of State for War, took a look for himself. He concluded the Gallipoli campaign, a waste of officers and men. In December 1915, with a quarter of a million men killed, wounded or missing, the Allies began to evacuate the peninsula. They had got little further than their original beachhead. The encounter of Turk against Anzac on the cliffs of Gallipoli was confirmation that the European war had now expanded into something else. The First World War. By 1915, nearly every family had at least one son who had marched off to battle. Left behind at home were millions of women, for whom every day brought the possibility of terrible news. Twenty-one-year-old Vera Britton, a student at Oxford University, described the endless wait for news of her fiancé, Roland. Ordinary household sounds became a torment. The clock marking off each hour of dread struck into the tension with the shattering effect of a thunderclap. Every ring at the door suggested a telegram. Every telephone call a long-distance message giving bad news. Vera's fiancé was serving at the front. So were her brother Edward and their close friend Victor. They'd been known as the Three Musketeers and Vera saw herself as a fourth. She left Oxford to become a nurse in London. In a surgical ward, I had told Roland, the nurses hardly occupy the silent-footed gliding role which they always do in storybooks. The mixture of gramophones and people shouting or groaning after an operation relieves you of the necessity of being quiet. They were blaring blatant gramophones Though the men found them consoling, perhaps because they subdued more sinister noises, they seemed to me to add a strident grotesqueness to the cold, dark evenings of hurry and pain. As Christmas 1915 approached, Vera received good news it was a note from Roland. Shall be home on leave, it read. Land Christmas Day. Two days later, the phone rang. Believing that I was at last to hear the voice for which I had been waiting, I dashed joyously into the corridor. But the message was not from Roland. It was not to say that he had arrived home that morning but to tell me that he had died of wounds on December 23rd.
Roland, I reflected bitterly, was now part of the corrupt clay into which war had transformed the fertile soil of France. He would never again know the smell of a wet evening in early spring. It was a bitter grey afternoon. I wondered however I was going to get through the weary remainder of life. I was only at the beginning of my twenties. I might have another forty, perhaps even fifty years to live. Victor died next. Vera prayed that her brother Edward would survive. But in the war's final year, he too was killed. Edward, like Roland, had promised me that if a life existed beyond the grave, he would somehow come back and make me know of it. I'd thought that of the two, Roland, with his reckless determination, would be the more likely to trespass from the infinite across the boundaries of the tangible. But he had sent no sign, and Edward sent none. Nor did I expect one. I knew now that death was the end, and that I was quite alone. There was no hereafter, no Easter morning, no meeting again. I walked in a darkness, a dumbness, a silence, which no beloved voice would penetrate. The manpower of Europe was not enough to satisfy the appetite of war. Imperial powers had to call for reinforcements, millions of them, from their colonies and dominions. Through local newspapers, the voice of the empire demanded that Africans rally to the flag. The present war is a world war. Without you, your white comrades cannot do anything. Everyone who loves his country and respects the British government, join this war without hesitation. A West African, Kande Kamara, was one of those who volunteered for the French army. The decision upset his father, who saw no reason why his son should die for white men. Please forgive me. I'm simply doing this for our house. If I die, I die as a man. I'll simply be buried as a man. Within particular strata of African society, service in the war represented an opportunity to serve the empire. The Great War opened up for people like Kamara a great opportunity to reach back into the past, uh, reconnect with the warrior lineage of, of his father, and to demonstrate his worth and value as, as a warrior, not just in Africa, but in a great worldwide conflict. Tens of thousands of Africans were shipped off to Europe. Some served as laborers, others as frontline soldiers. Kande Kamara never forgot the journey. Huddled in the lower decks of a transport ship, he found his six-day voyage was not the adventure he had expected. Some were getting very seasick. Some were vomiting. The smell of the ship the oil, the gut, was too unbearable. 
Some people didn't know where they were going, even why they were fighting. A lot of people spread the rumor that we would never come back, that we were going to be sold as slaves. Some said, if the ship sinks, who gives a damn? Because we're all going to die anyway. After arriving in France, Kamara's unit began training. When we arrived at Bordeaux, we were sent directly for parades. After resting, we went back for more parades. There were all kinds of nationalities. There were Fulas, Karanko, Yolonkas, Bambaros, Sanufis, Kesein, Toms, Becerra, and a lot more. Kamara described the sight of his first aircraft as a steamship that flies in the air. But at the front, he was puzzled by orders to dig what he called gutters, where soldiers hid for weeks while fighting continued both day and night. It seemed a strange way of waging battle. For many African warriors, or those who inherited a warrior tradition or a warrior lineage, uh, were baffled and had great difficulty in comprehending the way in which this war was being waged in, in Europe. The First World War seemed to be a war without meaning, a war without gain. Um, it's one aspect that comes across really strongly for African soldiers in the Western Front, that there seems to be a war without benefit. And what they meant by that was that this was a war which was not only a war which was not conducted honorably, in terms of the treatment of your opponent, um, but it was a war that produced for them individually no gain. You couldn't hold your teeth because of all your trembling, because during those days everything was going boom. It was terrible and hard. In the white man's war, you never say, I'm thirsty. You never say, I'm hungry. You fight and fight and fight until your heart tells you you're afraid. Precise casualty figures for Africans are unknown. But it is thought that at least a quarter of a million men were killed, wounded or missing. Their sacrifice did not always get them the recognition they deserved from their imperial rulers or from the men in the opposing trenches. We were black and we were nothing. Because of the color of our skins, the Germans called us boots. This hurt every black man because they actually underestimated us disgraced and dishonored us. Not all Imperial troops shared this experience. In the Middle East, Indian troops made an essential contribution to Allied victories. But for Kamara, in the French army, what he experienced on the battlefield made him doubt what Western civilization had to offer. The guns out there are roaring fast. 
The bullets fly like rain. The aeroplanes are coveting. They go and come again. The bombs talk loud. The mines crash out. No trench their might withstands. Who helped them all to do their job? The girls with yellow hands. As men marched off to war, women marched off to work. The result was a dramatic, if temporary, gender shift in the workforce of every fighting nation. Of all the trades women took over, none was more important than shell-making. In Britain, one million women poured into munitions factories. 28,000 of them worked here on Warren Lane in south-east London. The Woolwich Royal Arsenal was Britain's largest. But like all munitions factories, it was a hazardous workplace. The first time you go around, you think, what an interesting place. Then the evil smell becomes more noticeable. The particles of acid land on your face and make you nearly mad, feeling like pins and needles. Gabrielle West had shocked her father by joining the newly formed Women's Police Service. Her assignment was to keep order inside factories. The fumes often mean 16 or 18 casualties a night. You're blind and speechless by the time you escape. The conditions varied a lot. Some women had very, very bad conditions and women were killed. So there were the immediate dangers of industrial accident and injury um, and lesser injury as well. I mean, women cut their fingers, got grit in their eyes, um, um, experienced noxious fumes from all sorts of processes. But the other really um, major danger of women, which was very much hushed up at the time, was from TNT. And several hundred women did die from TNT poisoning. The first signs of TNT poisoning resembled those of the common cold nasal congestion, headaches and coughs. But prolonged exposure produced more alarming symptoms, as one young worker, Caroline Webb, would discover. It was all bright ginger, all our front hair. And all our faces were bright yellow, They used to call us canaries. This doctor, he was looking at us girls one day and he'd say, half you girls will never have babies. And the other half are too sick. God help you. The Woolwich Arsenal employed virtually no women before the war. By December 1917, there were 24,719 of them, making up 73% of the workforce. Women knew that without their supply of shells and bullets, their men would lose the war. It was very important for them that they were actually supporting the war effort. Um, although lots of them didn't really think much about what the war was about, they knew that their friends' relations, husbands, sons, were abroad, they were dying, there was a shell shortage, and they felt they really could do something to support the war effort. 
Sometimes when we come upon our little train, it will be all packed with different people. There'd be all the officers sitting there. Some of them used to look at us as if we were insects. And others used to mutter, well, they're doing their bit. We said, well, we don't mind dying for our country. No end of ZEP excitements lately. A few weeks ago, we heard distant guns in the middle of the night. We looked up, and there was the ZEP so low you could see the cars hanging underneath. My word, we did scoot. There was a tremendous din of firing, and things began to patter on the roof. I thought I was dead that time. The war on the battlefields of France had spread across the Channel and was reaching out to civilians in Britain. Zeppelins first appeared over London in 1915. A favourite target, Gabrielle West recorded in Hadari, was the arsenal at Woolwich. We were just going back to our hut when we heard wild yells of cheering saw the whole sky turn red. Then we saw the Zepp in flames to the north. All the workers in the arsenal roared and shrieked. All the boys sang Tipperary and all the neighbours scattered about congratulating each other. Even as the first Zeppelins bombed London, the rules of engagement were changing on the battlefield. In April 1915, at Ypres, the German army used a new weapon, poison gas. First came chlorine, the yellow gas, then came the green gas, then came mustard gas, the granddaddy of napalm. And each of these had appalling effects on men who were trapped in the trench system. It didn't break the defensive lines. It made the level of suffering much worse than it had been before. Wilfred Owen witnessed a man dying from gas poisoning. In one of his most famous poems, he captured another dimension of total war. Gas, gas, quick boys, an ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmet just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light as under a green sea, I saw him drowning. In all my dreams, before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If in some smothering dreams, you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in, and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face like a devil's sick of sin. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth-corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud of vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues. My friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory the old lie. Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. In 
In 1915, the Germans declared that passenger ships sailing to Allied ports were at risk of being sunk without warning. Civilian passengers, too, were now potential targets at sea. It was rapidly becoming evident that there was no way in which you could advance the war unless you broke with early ideas of rules of engagement and conceptualized the war as a totalizing experience, accepted the fact that the war would now have to be a total war. And the way in which to break the enemy would not just be through slaughtering soldiers on the battlefield. The way in which you would break your enemy would be by attacking the home front, by waging the war against civilians as much as against soldiers. On May the 1st, 1915, the Lusitania, the world's finest luxury liner, set sail from New York for Britain. It was owned by citizens of a so far neutral country, the United States. On board were nearly 2,000 passengers and crew. On the evening of May the 6th, the ship's captain received warnings of German U-boats off the coast of Ireland. Among the first class passengers was Margaret Ronda. We were, most of us, very fully conscious of the risk we were running. We used to discuss our chances. I can't help hoping, said one girl, that we get some sort of thrill going up the channel. My father and I had just come out of the dining room after lunching. I think we may stay up on deck tonight to see if we get our thrill, he said. I had no time to answer. I saw that the water had come over onto the deck. We were not, as I had thought, 60 feet above the sea. We were already under the sea. The ship sank, and I was sucked right down with her. When I came to the surface, I remember looking round at the sun and pale blue sky and calm sea, and wondering whether I had reached heaven without knowing it, and devoutly hoped I hadn't. Twelve hundred men, women and children were drowned. Everyone was now a target. On a scale never seen before, children were becoming exposed to the violence of total war. They fled from their homes. They feared being gassed. And they were bombed from the skies. But they were absorbed into the war in a more insidious way, as tools of propaganda. You can find very young baby of less than one year old with a gun in the hands going out from an egg and asking if there are some Bosches, some Germans somewhere, because they want to kill them. To consider that a baby less than one year old has to be a fighter and has to kill the enemy, that is, I think, impossible to stand but that was the reality of the propaganda of these times. 
children were taught to hate in specially adapted nursery rhymes. This is the house that Jack built. This is the bomb that fell on the house that Jack built. This is the Hun that dropped the bomb that fell on the house that Jack built. This is the gun that killed the Hun that dropped the bomb that fell on the house that Jack built. Through their magazine, Little Folks, British children as young as three would learn certain verses off by heart. Little girls and little boys Never suck your diamond toys Diamond soldiers it will make Tiny baby's tummy ache Mobilisation of men required mobilisation of minds. The emerging film industry added an epic dimension. Hollywood's The Little American became a box office hit. The propaganda against the German was extremely widespread, but nowhere was it more powerful than in the cinema. The Little American was really an attack on America's neutrality. Cecil B. DeMille put in the lead Mary Pickford, the most popular star of the era the most popular figure of the cinema that has ever lived, and this has to be borne in mind. She was even more popular around the world than Chaplin. So the power of that propaganda cannot be underestimated. And he went into production a few days after the United States obligingly went into the war. So he had a, an ideal vehicle of Hun hatred into which he piled everything he could think of. Total war demonized the enemy. It demanded all the resources of a nation. It transformed civilians into military targets. But in 1915, total war went a step further. Only hours after the first Allied soldiers had stepped onto the beaches of Gallipoli, the 20th century's first genocide began. The presence of a thriving and wealthy community of Christian Armenians in northeast Turkey was seen by Turks as a festering irritation. Armenia's cultural links with Russia, a wartime enemy, provided Turkey with the excuse it had been looking for. Their leaders were rounded up and executed. Then entire communities were marched off into the desert to die. A young medic in the German army, Armin Wegner, defied orders and smuggled a camera into a refugee camp. In the last few days, I've taken numerous photographs under penalty of death. I do not doubt for a moment that I am committing an act of treason. Hunger, death, disease, despair, shout at me from all sides. I was seized by terror and hurried out of the camp, my heart pounding. I was overcome by dizziness, as if the earth were collapsing on both sides of me into an abyss. The First World War was the biggest war ever to date. The Second World War was bigger still. 
It's no accident in my mind that both of them were marked by genocide. That is the logic of the brutalization of total war. In years to come, Armin Wegener would send a letter to Adolf Hitler pleading for the Jewish people. It was a plea which fell on deaf ears, for Hitler had learned a totally different lesson. He told his inner circle who remembers the Armenian massacres today?